good margin there. Today, we are going to read evacuations. And first, they killed my father. Um, the last time we read, the Khmer army came in and they uh, kind of were taking over. Notice that their army arrived in dirty cargo trucks. They wore faded black long plants pants and long sleeve shirts, red sashes, they carry rifles. They are, but they are not, um, you can see that they don't have fresh supplies. Um, this is April, 1975. So we are, the last section we read that was on April 17th. This is now later in April. After many hours, we are finally out of the city and on the road, though still moving very slowly. Where are we going? I ask Kim repeatedly, after it seems like we have been traveling forever. I don't know. We just passed the Po Cheng Tong Airport, which means we are on Highway 4. Stop asking me all the time. I burrow under my scarf to hide from the sun and resign myself to sulking. My body sags and I begin to grow tired. My eyelids struggle to stay open against the glaring sunlight and the dust from the road. The wind whips my hair all about, tickling my face, but I do not smile. I wince as the hot, dry air enters my nostrils. Kiev wraps the end of my scarf tightly over my nose and mouth to keep the dust out, and she tells me not to look over the side of the truck. In Cambodia, we have only two seasons, dry season, rainy season. Cambodia's tropical climate is dictated by the monsoons, which bring heavy rain from May to October. Kiev says during the rainy season, the country is a green paradise. She says there's so much water that the trees grow very tall and the leaves swell with moisture. They take on a dark metallic green color, looking as if they will burst like a water balloon. Before the monsoon, monsoons hit in May, we have to endure April, our hottest month with temperatures often reaching 110 degrees, so hot that even the children stay indoors to avoid the sun. It's this hot now. As we move farther and farther away from the city, the high-rise apartments disappear and thatched roof huts take their place. The buildings in the city are tall and close together, but the huts are low-lying and widely dispersed in the middle of the rice fields. As our truck moves slowly in the crowd of people, the wide paved boulevard gives way to windy, dusty roads that are no more than wagon trails. Tall elephant grass and prickly brown bush brush have replaced Phnom Penh's blooming flowers and tall trees. A queasy feeling grips me as I watch the villages pass by. As far as the eye can see, there are people marching in the road while huts stand empty and rice fields are left unattended. I fall asleep and dream that I am still at home, still playing hopscotch with my friends. When I wake, we are parked near an empty hut to rest for the night. We are in a world very different from Phnom Penh, yet we have traveled only 10 miles or so. The sun has gone down, relieving us of its burning rays. All around us, the field lights up with small fires illuminating the faces of women squatting by them to prepare meals. I can still make, our, make out thousands of people milling around or walking to unknown destinations. Others like us have stopped to rest for the night along the roadside. My family scrambles to set up our encampment in the field near an abandoned hut. My brothers gather wood to build a fire while Ma and Kiev prepare our meal. Chow is brushing Geek's hair, being careful not to pull it. When everything is set up, we gather around the fire and eat a dinner of rice and salted pork that Ma cooked earlier in the day. There are no tables or chairs for us to sit on. While we kids make do with squatting, my parents sit on a small, on a little straw mat that Ma has packed. I have to go to the toilet, I tell Ma urgently after dinner. You have to go in the woods. But where? Anywhere you can find. Wait, I'll get you some toilet paper. Ma goes away and comes back with a bunch of paper sheets in her hand. My eyes widen in disbelief. Ma, it's money. I can't use money. Use it. It is of no use to us anymore, she replies, pushing the crisp sheets into my hand. I don't understand this. I know that we must be in really big trouble. I know this is no time to argue, so I grab the money and head off to the woods. After I finish, Chow and I decide to explore the area. As we walk, we hear leaves rustling in the bushes nearby. 
our bodies tense and we clasp each other's hands, holding our breath, but then a small feline silhouette saunters lazily out of the bushes looking for food. The owners must have forgotten it in their hurry to leave. Chow, I wonder what happened to our cats. Don't worry about them. We had five cats in Phnom Penh. Even though we say they were our cats, we had no real claim to them. We didn't even have names for them. They came to our house when they were hungry and left when they were bored. Well, somebody's probably having them for dinner by now, Kim teases us when we ask him. We all laugh and scold him for saying such a thing. Cambodians do not generally eat cats and dogs. There are sp specialty stores where they sell dog meat, but at a very expensive price. It is a delicacy. The elders say that eating dog meat increases body heat, thus increases increasing energy, but you shouldn't eat too much of it or your body will burn up and combust. Hmm. Okay, then. Always interesting to learn about different cultures. That night, Ma tucks me in on the back of the truck. While Chow, Geek, and I sleep with her on the truck, the older kids sleep on the ground with Pa. It is a warm and breezy night, the kind that requires no blankets. I love sleeping outside with the stars. My imagination is captured by the bright, shining light, but I don't understand the vastness of the sky. Every time I try to wrap my mind around the concept of the universe, my mind spins as if caught in a whirlpool of information. I will never be able to understand. Chow, the sky is so big. Shh, I'm trying to sleep. Look at the stars. They're so beautiful, and they are winking at us. I wish I was up there with them and the angels. That's nice. Now go to sleep. You know the stars are candles in the sky. Every evening the angels come out and light them for us, so if we lose our way we can still see. Paul has told me in the past that I am blessed with a gifted imagination, and he likes the stories I tell. When I awaken in the morning, my siblings are already up. They were awakened by gunshots fired into the distant sky by the Khmer Rouge, but I was so tired I slept through it. My siblings all have gray pouches under their eyes. Their hair is knotted and sticking out in many directions. Slowly, I sit up and stretch out my sore shoulders and back. Sleeping in the truck is not as much fun as I thought it would be. Before long, a group of Khmer Rouge soldiers come by and yell at us to keep moving. After a small breakfast of rice and salted eggs, we get back in our truck and take off again. We drive for many hours, and everywhere we go, we see people walking in all directions. The sun is high and hot on our backs. It burns through my black hair as little beads of water collect around my hairline and on the curve of my upper lip. After a while, we all get on each other's nerves and start to fight. It's not much farther, kids. We're almost there. Paul tells us when we stop to have our lunch. Soon we, will be, we, soon we will be where it is safe. As Ma and Kiev prepare our meal, Pa and Meng disappear to gather firewood. When they return, Pa tells Choi that it is a good thing that we got out of the city as quickly as we did. He says the people he just talked to told him that the soldiers made everyone leave the city. They emptied schools, restaurants, and hospitals. The soldiers even forced the sick to leave. They were not allowed to go home first to their families, so many people are separated. Many old and sick people did not make it today, Chow offers grimly. I saw them on the side of the street, still in their bloody hospital robes. Some were walking, and others were pushed in carts or hospital beds by their relatives. Now I understand why Kiev kept wrapping the scarf around my head, telling me to keep my head down, to not peer over the truck side. The soldiers walked around the neighborhood, knocking on all the doors, telling people to leave. Those who refused were shot dead right on their doorstep. Pa shakes his head. Why are they doing this? Why are they doing this, Pa? Kim asks. Because they are destroyers of things. Chow and Kim look at each other, and I sit there feeling lost and afraid. Thank you. I don't understand. What does all this mean? I ask them. They look at me but say nothing. Yesterday, I was playing hopscotch with my friends. Today, we are running from soldiers with guns. After a quick lunch of rice with salted fish, we climb in the truck and move again. I watch as a stream of people seems to follow our trail. Fighting drowsiness caused by the smothering heat, my thoughts race from one subject to another. I question why we had to leave, where we are going, 
and when will we return home? I do not understand what is happening and long to go back home. The sudden sputtering and choking of our truck caught my daydreaming. It kicks and whines and finally stops. I climb off, hoping it will move again. The truck's out of petrol. That's gas. And there's no petrol station around here, Paul says. Looks like we have to walk the rest of the way. Everybody grab only some clothes and all the food you can carry. We have a long way to go yet. Paul then orders us what to take and what to leave behind. You, someone yells. We all stop what we are doing and stand paralyzed. You, a Khmer Rouge soldier comes over to us. Give me your watches. Certainly, with shoulders bent to show submission, Paul takes the watches off of Meng and Choi's wrists. Paul does not look the soldier in the eyes as he hands the watches over. All right, now move. The soldier orders and then walks away. When he is out of earshot, Paul whispers that from now on we are to give the soldiers anything they want or they will shoot us. We walk from the break of day until the dark of evening when night comes. We rest by the roadside near a temple. We unpack the dried fish and rice and eat in silence. Gone is the air of mystery and excitement. Now... I am simply afraid. April 1795. So we are still in April. Seven day walk. Yes. The first sight I see when I open up my eyes the next morning is the glum, upside-down face of Chow against the background of cloudy skies as she tugs at my hair. Wake up! We have to move again, she tells me. Slowly I sit up and rub the seeds out of my sleepy eyes. All around me, a sea of people wake, babies cry, old people groan, pots and pans clang against the sides of wagons whose wheels grind the dirt beneath them. There are many more people than the numbers I know to count with them, them with. My eyes follow Choi and Meng as they walk into the temple with big silver pots to fetch water. P.F. says there is always a well near a temple. Moments later, Choi and Meng return visibly shaken with their empty pots. We went into the temple but found no monks there, only a Khmer Rouge soldier, they tell Pa. They yelled for us to stay away from the temple well. We stopped and came back, but other people went in anyway. Chow's words are interrupted by the sound of gunshots coming from inside the temple. Hurriedly, we pack our belongings and leave the area. Later on, we hear the Khmer Rouge soldiers had killed two people inside the temple and wounded many more. Today, our third day on the road, I walk with a little more bounce in my step. In Phnom Penh, the soldiers had said we could return home after three days. The soldiers told us we had to leave because the United States was going to bomb our city. But I have not seen any planes in the sky and have heard no bombs dropped, it is strange to me that they made us leave just so we can turn back and go home after three days. I smile at the silly picture of us marching like black ants coming to a stop at the end of the day only to head back home. I do not understand, but I guess three days is how long it takes for them to clean the city. Pa, will we go home soon? The soldier said we can return home after three days. I tug at Pa's pants. It is afternoon and we are not even slowing down yet. Maybe, but meanwhile, we have to walk. But, Pa, this is the third day. Are we going to turn around and walk back home now? No, we have to keep walking. Pa says sadly. Reluctantly, I do what Pa tells me. Everybody has to carry something, so I pick the smallest item in the pile, the rice pot. As I walk, the pot becomes heavier and heavier in my hands as the sun climbs higher and higher in the sky. The metal handle digs and burns the palms of my hands. Sometimes I carry it with two hands in front of me. Other times I switch the pot from my right to my left arm. But it seems no matter how I carry it, the pot painfully bangs into some part of my leg. It is evening now, and I am losing hope that we can go home tonight. Tired and hungry, I drag my feet, taking smaller and smaller steps until I am far behind everyone else. Pa, I'm very hungry and my feet hurt, I yelled to him. You can't eat now. We have very little food left, and we need to ration it because we have a long way to go. I don't know why we have to save it. I stand still in the road, letting go of the rice pot to wipe dirt and tears from my cheeks. Our three days will soon be over. We can return home. Let's just go home. I want to go home. The words somehow come out between halting sobs. My 40-pound body refuses to walk any more. The red dust from the road and the sweat on my body has mixed to create a layer of mud on my skin 
making it dry and itchy. Paul walks over to Kiev and takes a ball of sticky rice out of the pot she is carrying. He comes over to me and hands me the food. My eyes look down at the ground in shame, but I take the food from him anyway. Silently, he strokes my hair while I eat my rice between choking sobs. Bending down, Paul looks me in my eyes and says softly, They lie. The soldiers, they lie. We cannot go home tonight. His words make me sob harder. But they said three days. I know. I'm sorry you believed them, but they lie. I don't understand why they lied. My voice quivers as I say it. I don't know either, but they lied to us. <sighs> my hopes crushed. I wipe my forearm across my nose, dragging snot all over my cheek. Paul gently cleans my face with his hand and then takes the rice pot from me and says I only have to carry myself for the rest of the trip. With a geek on her hip, Ma walks over to me and wraps my scarf around my head to protect me from the sun. I wish that I were a little baby like Geek. She doesn't have to walk at all. Ma carries her in her arms all the way. I am miserable, but at least I have shoes. Some of the people walk barefoot in the scorching heat, carrying their life's belongings on their backs or heads. I feel sorry for them knowing they are worse off than I am. And no matter how far we go, there are always more people along the way. When night falls, once again we make the road our home and sleep, along with the hundreds of thousands of other families fleeing from Phnom Penh. Our fourth day on the road starts the same as all the other days. Are we there yet? I keep asking Kim. When I receive no attention, I proceed to sniff and cry. Nobody cares about me! I moan and keep walking anyway. By noontime, we have reached the Khmer Rouge's military checkpoint in the town of Kambal. The checkpoint consists of no more than a few small makeshift tents with trucks parked beside them. There are many soldiers at this base, and it is easy to recognize them because they wear identical loose-fitting black pajama pants and shirts. All carry identical guns slung across their backs. They move quickly from place to place with fingers on the triggers of their weapons, pacing back and forth in front of the crowd, yelling instructions into a bullhorn. This is Comball Base. You are not allowed to pass until we have cleared you. Stand with your family in a line. Our comrade soldiers will come and ask a few simple questions. You are to answer them truthfully and not lie to the Angar. If you lie to the Angar, Angkar, we will find out. The Angkar is all-knowing and has eyes and ears everywhere. This is the first time I hear the word Angkar, which means the organization. Paul says the Angkar is the new government of Cambodia, and he tells us that in the past, Prince Sihanouk ruled Cambodia as a monarch. That's like a king. Then in 1970, unhappy with the prince's government, General La Nol deposed him in a military coup. The La Nol democratic government has been fighting a civil war with the communist Khmer Rouge ever since. Now the Khmer Rouge has won the war and its government is called the Angkar. To your right, you see a table where your comrade brothers sit waiting to help you. Anyone who has worked for the deposed government, ex-soldiers or politicians, step up to the table to register for work. The Angkar needs you right away. Anxiety spreads through my body at the sight of the Khmer Rouge soldiers. I feel like I have to vomit. Paul quickly gathers our family and stands us in line with other peasant families. Remember, we are a family of peasants. Give them whatever they want and don't argue. Don't say anything. Let me do all the talking. Don't go anywhere and don't make any moves unless I tell you to do so. Paul instructs us firmly. Standing in line wedged among many people, my nostrils are assaulted by the stale smell of bodies that have not been washed for many days. To filter the smell, I pull the scarf tightly over my nose and mouth. In front of us, the line splits in two as a large group of ex-soldiers, government workers, and former politicians walk over to the table to register for work. My heart pounds quickly against my chest, but I say nothing and lean against Paul's leg. He reaches down and puts his hand on top of my head. It stays there as if protecting me from the sun and the soldiers. After a few minutes, my head feels cooler and my heartbeat slows. Ahead of us in the line, Khmer so Rouge soldiers yell something to the crowd, but I cannot hear what they say. Then one Khmer Rouge soldier roughs, roughly jerks a bag off of one man's shoulder and dumps its contents on the ground. From this pile, a Khmer Rouge soldier picks up an old Lan No army uniform. The Khmer Rouge soldier sneers at the man and pushes him to another Khmer Rouge soldier standing beside him. 
The soldier then moves on to the next family. Eyes downcast, shoulders slumped, arms hanging loosely on both sides of him, the man with the lawn knoll uniform in his bag does not fight as another Khmer Rouge soldier points and pushes him away with the butt of his rifle. After many hours, it is finally our time to be questioned. I can tell we've been standing here a long time because the sun now warms my lower back instead of the top of my head. As a Khmer Rouge soldier approaches us, my stomach twists into tight knots. I lean closer to Paul and reach up for his hand. Paul's hand is much too big for mine, so I am only able to wrap my fingers around his index finger. What do you do? The soldier curtly asks Paul. I work as a packer in the shipping port. What do you do? The soldier points his finger at Ma. Her eyes focus on the ground, and she shifts Geek's weight on her hips. I sell old clothes in the market, she says in a barely audible voice. The soldier rummages through all our bags one by one. Then he bends down and lifts the lid of the rice pot next to Pa's feet. Gripping Pa's finger even tighter, my heart races as the soldier checks the pot. His face is close to mine. I concentrate on my dirty shoes, dirty toes. I dare not look into his eyes, for I have been told that when you look into their eyes, you can see the devil himself. All right, you are cleared. You may go. Thank you, comrade, Pa says meekly, his head bobbing up and down to the soldier. The soldier is already looking past Pa and merely waves his hand for us to hurry on. Passing the checkpoint safely, we walk a few hours more until the sun goes to sleep behind the mountains, and the world becomes a place of shadows and shapes once again. In the mass of people, Pa finds us a spot of unoccupied grass near the side of the road. Ma puts Geek down next to me and tells me to keep an eye on her. Sitting next to her, I am struck by how pale she looks. Breathing quietly, she fights to keep her eyelids open, but in the end, she loses and falls to sleep. Her growling stomach talks as mine grumbles in return. Knowing there will be nothing to eat for a while, I lie down on the small bundle of clothes next to her and rest my head on another. Quickly, I too fall asleep. When I wake, I am sitting upright on the straw mat and Kiev is pushing food into my mouth. Eat this, she says, rice balls with wild mushrooms. Choi and Meng pick the mushrooms in the woods. With my eyes still closed, the rice ball works itself slowly down my dry throat and quiets my hunger. After I finish my small portion, I lie back down and leave the world of the Khmer Rouge soldiers behind. In the middle of the night, I dream I am at a New, Year New Year's parade. The Cambodian Lunar New Year this year falls on the 13th of April. Traditionally, for three days and nights, we celebrate the New Year with parades and food and music. In my dream, fireworks crackle and boom noisily, rejoicing in the New Year celebration. There are many varieties of food on the table. Red cookies, red candies, and red roasted pig, and red noodles. Everything is red. I'm even wearing a new red dress that Ma has made for this special occasion. In the Chinese culture, it is not proper for girls to wear this color because it attracts too much attention. Only girls who want attention wear red, and they are generally viewed as bad and improper, more than likely from a bad family. But New Year's is a special occasion, and during the celebration, everyone is allowed to wear red. Chow is next to me clapping her hands at something. Geek is giggling and trying to catch up with me as I run and spin around and around. We all have on the same dress. We look so pretty with red ribbons in our ponytails, red rouge on our cheeks, and red lipstick on our lips. My sisters and I hold hands, laughing as fireworks boom in the background. I wake up the next morning to the voices of my brothers and father whispering to each other about what went on in the night. Pa, Meng says in a frightened voice, a man told me the noise last night was the Khmer Rouge soldiers opening fire on all the people who registered for work. They killed every one of them. Their words push at my temples, making my head throb with fear. Don't say anything. If the soldiers hear us, we will be in danger. Hearing this makes me afraid, and I walk over to Pa. We've been walking and walking for five days now. When can we go home? Don't talk any more, he whispers, and hands me over to Kiev. Kiev takes my hand and leads me to the woods so I can go to the bathroom. We have only taken a few steps when Choi stops us. Turn and walk back. Don't go any farther, he yells. She has to go. There's a dead body in the tall grass only a few feet from where you are. That's why this spot was left empty last night. I grip Kiev's hand tighter and suddenly notice the smell that hits my nostrils. It is not the smell of rotten grass or my own body odor, but a smell so putrid that my stomach coils. A smell similar to that of rotten chicken innards left out in the hot sun far too many days. 
Everything surrounding me becomes blurry, and I do not hear Kiev telling me to move my leg. I hear only the buzzing of flies feasting on the human corpse. I feel Kiev's hand pull at me, and my feet automatically move in her direction. With my hand in hers, we catch up with the rest of the family and begin our sixth day of marching. On our walk, the soldiers are everywhere prodding us along. They point and give us directions with their guns and bullhorns. In the scorching April heat, many older people become ill from heat stroke and dehydration, but they dare not rest. When someone falls ill, the family throws out his belongings, puts the sick person on someone's back or a wagon, if the family's lucky enough to have one, and march on. We walk all through the morning and afternoon, stopping for food and to rest only when the sun goes down. All around us, other families also have stopped to rest for the night. Some stagger into the field, picking up firewood to cook their meals. Others eat what they have cooked earlier and fall asleep as soon as they lie down. We walk around the curled up bodies to find an empty area of our own. Exhausted, Ma and Kiev struggle to set up our resting spot and start a fire. From one of the plastic bags, we carry our remaining belongings. In Kiev takes out a bed sheet and spreads it on the ground. Ma unrolls the straw mat and lines it up next to the bed sheet. While I sit with Geek on small bundles, rubbing my burned and aching ankles, Chow and Kim move our other bags onto the bed sheet. Holding her hand, I attempt to lead Geek to sit on the sheet, but she pulls out of my hand and toddles over to Pa. He picks her up and holds her to his chest. His face, brown and blistered from the sun, rests at the nape of his neck as his body swivels left and right, and before long, she is asleep. Our food supply is reduced to only a few pounds of rice, so Mang, Chow, and Kim have to forage for other food to supplement the rice. They walk half a mile to the nearby town of Ang Snur and return an hour later. Their figures move toward us slowly. Kim carries an armful of dry wood, and in Mang's hand is a small branch piercing two small fish and some wild vegetables. Chow walks toward us with a small pot and an ecstatic grin on his face. Ma, look, he calls to her, barely able to contain his glee. Sugar! Brown sugar? Ma exclaims, taking the pot away from him. Though I am tired, those two words bring me running to the direction of the pot. Brown sugar, I repeat quietly. I never knew how two little words could bring me so much happiness. Ma, let me have a taste. There's almost a quarter of a pot of it. Shh! Don't say it so loud, he have warns me, or people will come and beg us for some. I notice a few of our neighbors look in our direction. Here, everyone, have a small taste. We have to save some, Ma says as we gather around her. My siblings stick their fingers into the sugar and lick what they are able to pull out. Me, 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 I beg Ma as she slowly lowers the pot to my level. I know it is my one chance to get as much sugar as I can, so I wait a few seconds to form enough spit in my mouth. Then I put my finger in my mouth and swish the spit around my finger to make sure I wet every millimeter of my finger. When I am satisfied that my finger is wet enough, I take it out of my mouth and slowly roll it around on top of the sugar. My finger rolls so slowly that I can feel the rough grains bonding to it. When I pull it out of the pot, I am happy to see what I have achieved. I have more sugar on my one finger than anyone else does. Carefully, I place my other hand under my treasure to catch any grains that might fall from my finger. Slowly, I walk my finger back to my spot on the mat and begin to eat each grain of the sugar. After dinner, Ma takes us girls to a nearby pond, which is already crowded with people washing their clothes and naked children tentatively putting their heads under the muddy water. The children all look too tired to bop up and down, laugh, or splash at one another. Ma instructs us to strip off our clothes. I remove my brown shirt, a shirt that was yellow when I hurriedly dressed six days ago. Naked, Chow, Geek, and I wait while Ma removes her clothes from under her sarong and hands them over to Kiev. With no soap, Kiev takes the clothes to the edge of the river and scrubs them against the rocks to clean them, get them clean. With Geek balanced on one of her hips, Ma takes my hand and walks Chow and I into the pond for our first wash in six days. Hand in hand, we stop when the water reaches my waist. The water feels cool and soft on my skin, slowly peeling away the layers of grime that it has collected. The slippery grass in the water sways back and forth to the rhythm of our movements, gently brushing against my legs. Some of the blades slither around my ankles, sending chills up and down my spine. I jump and fall into the water, pulling Chow with me, who is still holding on tight to Ma's hand. When I resurface, they are all laughing at me. I am happy to have all of us laughing together again. In the morning, Ma, makes, Ma wakes everyone, and we get ready for our seventh day of walking. 
The road ahead of us shimmers in the heat, and the dust swells are everywhere, burning my eyes. In the distance, my eyes focus on a lone bicyclist. I cannot tell how tall he is, only that he is very thin. It is strange that he is traveling against the flow of traffic. All of a sudden, I am startled by Ma's screams. Between loud, halting sobs, my mom ma, ma manages to say, It's your Uncle Lang! Liang. With our hands in the air and bodies jumping up and down, we, wor we wave excitedly to our uncle. Uncle Liang waves one hand back and pedals his bike faster in our direction. He comes to a stop a few feet from us, and all at once we rush toward him. Blinking his eyes, he takes Ma into his arms, with Pa standing quietly beside them. All the worries and fears of the past few days are now over, for at last he has found his sister. Uncle Liang hands Ma a package from his front bike rack, and while she opens the cans of tuna and other food, he tells Pa that this morning other people from Phnom Penh arrived in his village. The new arrivals told him of the evacuation and how the Khmer Rouge forced everyone to leave all the cities, including Phnom Penh. Batumbang and Siem Reap. Hearing this, he got on his bike and has been looking for us all morning. He then shares with us the glorious news that Ma's oldest brother, Liang, is on his way to pick us up in a wagon. A smile of joy crosses over my face, knowing I will not have to walk anymore, and then in a few days we can ride in their wagon home. Standing next to Uncle Liang, I have to tilt my head back as far as I can to see his face because he is so tall. Even then, all I can see is the shape of his thin lips and wide, black nostrils that flare once every few seconds as he talks to Ma. At almost six feet tall, Uncle Second Uncle Kim Liang hovers above all of us. His long, thin arms and legs make him look like the stick figures I used to draw in my school book. Uncle Liang lives in a village called Krang Troop. Both Uncle Liang and Uncle Hiang have lived in the countryside since before the revolution and have never lived in a city. The Khmer Rouge considers them uncorrupted model citizens for their new society. Pa says we will go and live with their uncles in their village. The wagon, pulled by two yellow skinny cows, moving very slowly, arrives later that evening while Pa and Ma talk to my uncle. I quickly claim a seat in the wagon with Chow and Geek. Our trail takes us on a gravel road along Route 26 westward until we reach the Khmer Rouge occupied village of Bat Dang. No matter where we go or in which direction we turn, there are people marching ahead and behind us. In the midst of the crowd, our wagon passes the Khmer Rouge village without stopping. We veer westward, leaving our roadside companions far behind. Somewhere between Bat Dang and Krang Troop, I fall asleep. So I need you to write a paragraph, just a paragraph, about how you would feel if you were this little girl. Um, Lung. Her, and, and to spell her name, L-O-U-N-G. Um, you can do it for homework. Yeah. Um, so I want you to maybe keep a couple pages stapled together or a little um, a little notebook and we're going to just respond to how you think you would handle what Leung has been handling in these last seven days. Yeah, a paragraph. But we're gonna we're gonna add to it later. Like there will be other questions to respond to. Okay.